going to be introducing you to uh, another friend of ours. Uh, this is uh, Kyle Polish. Kyle has been one of the only people I think has done a talk almost every every skeptic camp we've had. This is number seven. I can't remember if you've done all seven. I think you went to Vietnam or something, or some vacation or something in January. Like I don't know why, but <laughs> <laughs> good memory. You got it exactly right. Was it Vietnam? Yeah, it was. Sometimes things stick in my head. I don't know why that is, but it, it is. And uh, so Kyle often plays trivia with us on Thursday nights. I keep inviting people to come and play trivia with us. But um, uh, Kyle Polish is a is had uh, a talk once before at one of our skeptic camps on the missing four one one conspiracy. I, I don't even know what I would call it. And he is our most viewed video on our YouTube channel because of, I think that the person that he was talking about has shared it on their social media. And I, I think it's got like a thousand comments or something like that now, almost all negative. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Deborah and I keep getting the links saying, you know, oh, look, there's another one. And then there's another one and there's another one. You're not well liked. I'm sorry. <laughs> It is what it is. What are you one community do? of Bigfoot hunters. <laughs> right. I don't think we're going to talk about that today. But anyway, so Kyle has been very generous with his time. You guys keep, uh, we keep talking about numbers on our Wikipedia pages and how we're able to know how many views these different Wikipedia pages we've done. Um, and it's because of Kyle, because he wrote the software for uh, something we call Stat Badger, which allows us to be able to track our mm -hmm. our views. And Mark Edward came up with that name. He's telling me in the corner over here. <laughs> he came up with the name Stat Badger. So, um, so uh, Kyle has given us so much help over the years, and um, and everybody who participates in these things. Uh, brings their little bit of expertise in their area into these things and, and things you didn't even know you needed. So um, I'm going to introduce uh, Kyle. I wanted to put in the show notes his podcast, his really wonderful podcast on uh, called Data Skeptic. He um, talks a lot about all kinds of topics. Some of them are over my head. Some of them are I'm totally understand and I get, and it's really wonderful. Uh, I think the last one was on, I should have just looked, I just listened to it, was on you had two people on and you were talking about earthquake detection, earthquake detections and the people, how they can volunteer right. and be able to listen. I guess they train you to listen mm -hmm. to the earthquake noise and to do something on a computer and rank it or something like that. Something about doors closing versus a train going by or I don't know, but it was really interesting as far as um, this group is trying to, trying to um, uh, categorize source the data. Yeah, so that hopefully we can use it to to do predictions of earthquakes in the future. Right. All right. Exactly. Ah, sometimes things sink in. It shocks me to do my course sometimes what I, I learned. All right. So I'm going to turn it over to Kyle. Thank you so much for doing this first today. I need to find you on my little screen so I can screen share you. All right. Well, I'm going to screen share too. Ah, uh, he's in a disco. <laughs> All right. That's what I keep saying. So we're, oh, there you are. You disappeared. The thing about, you guys may not know about uh, running these kinds of things. I have uh, multiple screens, but things move around like doom, 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 and then they hide behind things. So it's, it's mm -hmm. having multiple screens is wonderful, but sometimes things hide. All right. I'll... Oh, I'm spotlighted. Have you guys got my uh, screen with my title slide here? Yep. yep. All right. So. I picked a somewhat provocative title. It wasn't true uh, to say I don't know anyone who has COVID-19. When I submitted the title, surprisingly, I only knew one. Uh, my father's cousin passed due to COVID-19 related complications. Since then, the number's three or four now. Uh, one of my wife's friends has been come down with it and someone who's working on the house actually. But still, for as big a deal as this is, I find a lot of people saying, you know, hey, I don't really know anyone or that many people who have it. And uh, without, you know, some of the basic statistics to understand this kind of thing, it's very natural to me that uh, a person might think this is smaller than it is or could arrive at the conclusion that it's a, a hoax or things like that. So I wanted to share a few thoughts on some of the statistics around it. So it's not the case that I didn't know anyone who had it, but maybe a better framing would be, how is it that I seem to know so few infected people? Um, and I say that as a person who is not a medical worker, uh, it had the you know luck of being in a profession where I could easily transition to working from home, my wife as well. 
Um, so maybe some of this is just conditioned upon our circumstances. Um, but to kick this off, I'm reminded of something called the birthday paradox, which I'm going to take for granted most people know. Um, and the secret to it being a little surprising is that it's not someone else on the call, uh, this call having about 50 people sharing your birthday, but that two people should share the same birthday. So uh, a call this big, it would be uh, not impossible, but quite surprising if there was not at least one pair of birthday participants uh, listening in today. Doesn't mean you share my birthday, just that two amongst us share it. Uh, and of course, this curve changes if you make the conditions more strict. You want to have three people on the same birthday or something like that. Um, but probabilities have to be thought of in terms of the group they describe. So let's frame the question and some of the numbers in context here. I went back to 2018, in which the estimated number of Americans was about 200 and uh, sorry, 329 million. Uh, in that same year, there were 3.8 million births. That's a 1.2 uh, percentage of that increase, and a and uh, 2.8 million deaths, or about 0.9 percentage of the population in the United States, passed away in just that year. Um, so let's break that down a little further. We can say that the top 10 causes of death in that year accounted for 2.1 million of those 2.8 million deaths. So the majority of people, uh, or at least a large portion of them, happened to pass from 10, uh, the 10 most common reasons. So let's break down those next. And in the spirit of the trivia games, I know a lot of you guys participated in, I thought I'd reveal some of the top 10 here and maybe think of this like a bonus round. These are the numbers uh, out of 2.1 million broken down. Maybe you can guess as we go, what was the number two, number three, and so on cause of death in the US. Again, 2018, there's my source. Uh, first one, maybe not a surprise to some of you, heart disease. Uh, second, no surprise to me, cancer. Some of these others as we went down and I don't want to cast judgment. I don't know what's preventable or not. This is according to injury facts at uh, NSC. But there are your top 10 reasons for um, uh, fatality in the US 2018. Why isn't COVID-19 on this list? Why didn't it make the top 10? Well, the simple answer is because this is 2018 and no one died of COVID-19 in 2018. Uh, but if they had, or that is to say, if these were the numbers for last year and we could line this up, where would it fall? So take a wild guess before I reveal. Right there. Um, as of my last check, 326,000 uh, US deaths, 1.83 million worldwide, and uh, 20 million cases versus 84 million. Um, so uh, quite obviously a significant thing going on is uh, should come as no surprise to everyone. R squared is one of those statistics that uh, I think we heard about early on in the pandemic, I wanted to remind you of. It is the rate at which an infected person is likely to infect R naught number of other people. So uh, a 1.0 would be, is like a turning point. That's every infection produces one more infection, which is sort of perpetual. You really want something less than one because that means it's dying out. Anything greater than two is growing, which is problematic. And here are some comparison points for your reference. I didn't include COVID-19 for a reason I'll, I'll revisit, but uh, basically for, uh, I thought it would confuse some of the issue here because you need to put that in context for a lot of conditional probability aspects. Um, another thing on the technical side, I'm gonna mention in passing before I, I break this down to some more simpler concepts is just to say there's an important idea called the SIR model susceptibility, infectiousness, and recovered. So uh, the susceptibility is the blue line. You can imagine at the beginning that uh, we are all susceptible, but uh, as the red line of infection grows up, some number of us have had it, have survived or not, and are recovering. And this, these three functions and this set of equations describe the general trend of a pandemic. So there are fairly complicated mathematics or more complicated than this that one can use to model these things out. But I want to give you just the basic statistical tools, and you really don't need these sort of fancy things to understand the everyday aspects of it. Um, why might I not know that many people that have COVID-19 could also be addressed from like a social networking point of view? I think a lot of you guys know this idea about six degrees to degrees to the actor Kevin Bacon, that um, he's appeared in a lot of films with an eclectic cast so that he's well connected. Uh, I actually didn't check if he got COVID-19. I hope you didn't, Kevin. 
Um, but if he, instead of appearing in movies, was going and shaking hands with all those people in one day, he might have been more susceptible. Interesting skeptical aside, this whole Kevin Bacon is the most most um, you know connected actor, not true at all. Um, in fact, there's a bit of a debate on who is, depending on the mathematical approach you use and depending on the time at which you measure, because, of course, this is an evolving dynamic process. One of these four or one of these six people is actually the most uh, connected Hollywood actor. Perhaps that's a talk for another day. Um, let's get down to the basics of what you need statistically to understand the pandemic a little bit. Conditional probability. So you have unconditional probability that X is true. And then you have conditional that X is true, given you know some other fact. So um, the fact that uh, someone drives to work, that's a set, we'll call it X. And those who have valid driver's licenses is Y. Um, now, one would hope that the Venn diagram is very overlapping here, that if you drive to work, you have a license. Uh, if you don't drive to work, whether or not you have a license, sort of irrelevant. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Or something a little bit more independent. Let's talk about allergy to nuts and being left-handed. I'm in only one of those groups. Um, so sometimes there's a high correlation, sometimes there's not. Um, when we talk about what's the unconditional probability I might be infected, if I'm just drawing a random person out of a hat, we're looking at the number of infected people divided by the total population. Fairly straightforward. Uh, in the US, that would be uh, 20 million infectees over our approximate population. And uh, just to break things down to uh, maybe a local level for a lot of us here, what about the state of California specifically? 2.3 million over uh, 39 million. If you're good at arithmetic, you already know the question marks, but here are your a priori probabilities. Just being a US citizen, if that's all I know about you, my guess would be you are 6.1% probability you've been infected. My guess goes down conditioned on the fact that I know you live in California. Why is that? Well, that's a complicated issue. Uh, the, the simple answer or the, the hand wavy answer is because those are what the numbers tell me. Um, why is it that California is not a perfect representation or a perfect match of the nation? Well, that could be due to just random chance. It could be due to better preventative measures or a wide assortment of other things. I'll allow you guys to speculate. I'm just talking about the numbers. Um, here are some things where I'm not going to reveal the question marks at the end of the slide because I don't know. But uh, think about it for a moment. What is the probability you're infected conditioned on the, fr the fact that you're a frontline worker? Uh, one might expect that to be higher than average. That seems intuitive, but it very well might be lower if your access to the right gear and your education and commitment to preventative measures might make you better than the average person uh, at, at avoiding this. Um, similarly, what if I have seven roommates? Doesn't tell me, you know, anything about are those all eight people in a bubble living at home, but that my, the probability of that person is conditioned on the information you have. So if you're uninformed and you're conditioned on uh, only basic information, you have a weak understanding of the situation. Um, how is it that, uh, the question I kind of reframed my original title to, how is it that I seem to know so few infected people when in fact we're going through uh, arguably our second major surge here in the US. Well, maybe I should reframe that again and say, let's look to the future. And uh, I can walk you through it in the second leg here of my slides and whatnot of what is likely to happen over the next year and what can we say about where things are going? What can we learn from the historical data and the trends here and things like that? So fast forward a year from now, how many infected people am I going to know? Well, there's our historical data. I pulled and refreshed this as of this morning for uh, U.S. daily infection rate. A couple of notes here, too, just to comment on some of the statistical notions of this. This low point happens to be Christmas Day. Um, that is probably due to underreporting. One might assume that uh, that is a less likely day someone would submit and be tested and all that. Um, and the very next day we see a spike which the eye very much wants to level out and say, you know, that that's kind of carryover. And that is a very real possibility. That could be uh, why these, these things have what's called a lag of one is because of the holiday. It could also be that those are new infections from uh, Christmas Day meeting uh, in, 
you know, less than ideal conditions? Probably not, given that we know the disease has a bit of an incubation period. This is probably just a statistical artifact of the fact that you'd have less people submitting for tests on Christmas Day or maybe even less places to submit to get the test. Um, I can't say that with certainty, although my eye, my intuition tells me that's exactly the case here, just given the magnitudes of this. These are similar types of problems that you run into in a lot of climate change forecasting, I've noticed, where one has to understand complicated aspects about the world and how climate even works, how you model in El Nino and things like that. Um, so the data doesn't always tell the full story, although in this case, it seems to be telling a nice story does seem to be a little bit past a peak, hopefully declining, but we don't know. What will the future hold? Um, the data alone can't tell us. I can apply a large number of mathematical procedures to this to say, how do things extend into the future? Um, there's a lot of machine learning approaches and different math tricks, but they don't take into account the conditional probability. These curves are entirely conditioned upon whether or not our population wears masks effectively and social distances effectively. They are very much conditioned upon the availability of vaccines, the willingness of the public to take them, and how quickly that all takes place. Uh, so even having, let's say, a, a vaccination rate of 50%, which I don't know if that's even the goal, but maybe Fauci will tell us that kind of stuff at some point where we should be hitting these milestones, you also have to have the right people connected. If you're a social mingling person who doesn't get that vaccination and goes out and carries, we all know what happens there compared to a stay-at-home person that might refuse for some health condition reason. Um, but how would we do this purely from, uh, oh, sorry, I skipped a slide, purely from a mathematical point of view? And I'll, I'll criticize some of these methods in a moment, but I want you guys to understand how someone looks, like, looks at this data if they maybe had training in stock market analysis and that sort of thing. So we have our historical data, what's going on infection-wise, and we, of course, like to know where is it going in the future? Um, we've acknowledged there are these conditional probability things we're not going to find out, but we can do some things called time series decomposition to better understand the data and the trends and things like that. So people who look at time series think of a, uh, maybe I should define time series, it's just a, a data point or a measurement, an observation just like this on every day, or it could be even every hour or every second. Sometimes that's data emitted by a machine, you know, taking telemetry re readings in a factory. Sometimes it's a stock market ticker or the number of page views to a Wikipedia page in a day. Could be literally anything. If it has a sequential nature to it, some aspect of time that's interesting, we can pose it as a time series problem. Time series seem to have three major components. Their trend, that is sort of where they're going, generally speaking, over time. What in the literature they'll call seasonality, but I hate this term because I always think of the seasons like, you know, spring, fall, summer, winter, that kind of stuff. It's really more of a periodicity. Seasonality could capture weekly effects or monthly effects, things like that. And lastly, noise, or we'll see it called residual in a moment. These are either the unpredictable things or the things I have not predicted yet. So let's set aside COVID-19 uh, historical trends and just look at some raw data. It doesn't matter what this data is. This is uh, on our x-axis, just some time. We've taken measurements. Maybe hopefully that's your bank account, right? That would be nice uh, going up over time, but having some regular effects, maybe payday is there, and then you, you go on a spending spree and you're uh, thrifty for a while. Doesn't matter what the data is, can be anything. This is the raw data as measured, the same way I could measure number of infections uh, submitted per day. Next, a technique, and there are, I won't cover how these work, but there are mathematical techniques that will try and break this down. First, extracting the trend. So again, think of this as your bank account. Of course, your day-to-day -day spending is up and down, but if you're lucky, you're uh, what they call monotonically increasing, always going up, always having that balance jump up a little bit. Um, then there is that seasonality. And again, think of this more as repeating or periodic than seasonal. Uh, in the weather sense of the word, uh, some trend that seems to occur on a regular basis with some lag that every 14 days, every 30 days, whatever the case may be. And uh, if you have all of these three things, notice, uh, and maybe your eye can put this together, the top bar is the sum of the bottom three. So what is some time series, but it's trend, it's regular periodic effects, and it's noise, the things that don't fit your little model of the trend in the seasonality. 
that noise, if it looks totally random like dice rolls, probably means you've done a good job, that your model is complicated enough to capture everything without being too complicated. Um, if there are some regularities here, like, oh, that's a big outlier, things like that. Those could be indications of things you've missed, in which case Occam's razor comes up. Do we overcomplicate our model to include more ways of modeling and accounting for holiday effects and uh, the fact that, you know, there was a weekend at play or a sporting event and things like that? Or do you prefer a simpler model, which is a little looser with the data, but uh, more parsimonious with the fit? These are complicated questions and it takes quite a bit of expertise in these modeling techniques and things to really come down to. So um, as is always a good advice, you should defer to the experts on these types of predictions, of which I am not. I'm not trained in epidemiology. I know enough statistics to be dangerous. But the one statistic I hope I can leave you guys with today is conditional probability. Because knowing some facts, like the likelihood I am to be infected, is totally conditioned upon the other facts you know about me, like the luxury I've had in that my career allows me to work at home, or uh, the fact that you know I wear my mask when I go out in public and I live in a state that has access to this and that. So um, I guess that's all my thoughts here on the stats you might need for better understanding the pandemic. If you like topics like this, check out Data Skeptic. It's our weekly podcast on things like artificial intelligence and machine learning and stats. Uh, we're talking all right now about a topic called consensus. And uh, very shortly, we're going to talk more about this time series stuff in the near future. So there's some of the places you can check us out if you're interested. Terrific. Clap, 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 clap. Scary. <laughs> yes and no. I mean, very scary numbers, but um, we've learned a lot as a species. We can control this thing if we culturally are willing to do it. Well, okay. So here's the scary part is what I'm talking about is there's a lot of math people in the chat. <laughs> All right, let's get into it. Oh my God. All right, you guys. Now I have, I'm going to have to just narrow this down really quick to some to just a couple because we don't have the time because you guys will talk COVID till the cows come home or whatever. So let's see. Oh my gosh, uh, lagged correlation. The example appears heteros. Oh my God, I don't know what that is. Um, uh, I don't. I'm not. I don't see what you see, but I assume the word is heteroskedasticity. Does it I, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an important idea, actually. It's that. Um, as something goes up, it varies more. So if you're just measuring, you know, bank accounts of five-year-olds, presumably they don't have a lot of money, uh, bank accounts of people in their 80s, you see a lot more variance. There's billionaires and there's people scrimping by. Um, the bigger it gets, the more variance there is in it, complicating the analysis. Okay. Um, so can you give a quick synopsis of why do I don't seem to know so many people who have died or who have... Uh, COVID, you know, whenever I know a lot of people and the numbers that I see on the news all the time are so huge. Right. Well, uh, go back to those numbers when I was giving the top 10 deaths. Recall that COVID-19 would be the third killer in 2018. Mm -hmm. The first two were heart disease and cancer. And ask yourselves, do you know anyone who in the calendar year 2018 died of heart disease or cancer? Some of you do, for sure. Not everyone does. Um, over a long enough time span, you must. And it's a similar thing at play here. If you didn't know anyone in 2018 who died of heart disease or cancer, it wouldn't be surprising for you to have not known about someone in the third position who died of COVID-19. That's, that's a beautiful way of summing it up. And also, I guess, if we do hear of somebody who has, it, the media is picking up on it, it's a new thing. And you know everybody's talking about, oh, did you hear You know that Don Wells from Gilligan's Island died of uh, COVID? Not sure. mentioning the, you know, however many other celebrities or whatever have died this year that we didn't die of COVID. It, it springs to your mind. It's, uh, again, remembering the hits and forgetting the misses kind of thing. Very much so, yeah. And uh, especially just how you're connected, you know. Um, if uh, it disproportionately affects different communities. So if you're better connected to those communities, you're more likely to know someone. Yeah, the majority of the people that I would personally interact with are probably people who are 
staying at home or wearing masks, very, very taking this very seriously. I don't think I know a lot of people who are COVID deniers or are refusing to wear masks or, you know, any of that. So, so again, that's going to skew my results as well. I have one anti-masker friend and he got COVID-19. <laughs> I got to check in and see if he's still anti-mask or not. How does that work out? Because maybe, uh, anyway. <laughs> um, something earlier on, Paula said, keep in mind any people skeptical about COVID death at Mounts will counter deaths caused by other reasons are listed as COVID deaths. That's inflating in a number. Oh, yes. There are some very complicated statistics. This is going to be a thing for master's students to study for two decades because uh, people are less likely to submit for a lot of other surgeries this year because they're fearing infection. Um, everything is skewed in so many interesting ways. It's a very novel event. One thing affects another thing. Um, Rob Palmer said, isn't the numerator a guess because not everyone is tested and 40% or more are ace? Oh, yes. Uh, I am not a first source on any of those numbers. I kind of Googled deaths and put in a number. I didn't... Uh, uh, look at the exact mechanism of, of how they come up with that. Uh, there are, I know there are, you know, people get into what should be counted which way, and there are interesting conversations to have, but it's usually in the second or third decimal point, really. We were also having fun in chat. I don't think you saw it because you were talking about we were all putting our birthdays in there to see if we found anybody else who had a oh, birthday. Oh, yeah. How'd that work out? Um, no, Janine and I. Well, Janine and my son, Caspian, have the same birthday, and turns out Queen Elizabeth is also in there. If anybody else wants to put their birthday in there and see if we have anybody else in this fifth representation of 55 people in this room, uh, see if we have a birthday match, because it seems like we should, right? We, 55 we should. People. With a high probability, we should. We, there's yeah. nothing certain, of course. And if I want me to scroll back to that slide, I'll get you a number. We've got about 50. And so that eyeballing my rough thing here, give me a minute to scroll, uh, looks like about a 98% probability we would have a pair of birthdays. So yeah, you guys, a little now. bit surprising if we didn't, but not outside the realm of possibility. Right, right. Okay. So um, I also wanted to mention that if anybody remembers the, old, the uh, podcast Skepticality, that you used to be one of the data people who would help out with Wendy's um, project, The Odds Must Be Crazy, you used to give data analysis. So you've been really useful in a lot of different places. M Mark over here in the corner is saying, that was so much fun. <laughs> you like that. I really enjoyed that. I love those segments. But it was fun listening to the statistics of um, why something, why it looked like you would go on vacation to Tibet and run into your next door neighbor. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. You know, it would be funnier if we didn't have odd coincidences in our lives, if yeah, things were that mundane. And the, the thing I found being a social kind of person is the more you speak to somebody, the more you're going to find that you have something in common with them, especially if you're pretty good at like, okay, well, let's talk about your cat. Now let's talk about sure. your, where do you get your pedicures done? Okay. Let's talk about what you like to eat. You know, the more you talk and the more things yeah. conversation. No, let's talk about our disinterest in the same music. <laughs> You will find many. Oh my gosh, there's 24 messages I can't see. No, no. You guys stop, stop, stop. Oh, they're putting birthdays. Okay, somebody else will have to look into this birthday thing for me um, because we're going to have to move on. Unfortunately, uh, again, um, Kyle has done a bunch of talks for uh, different places and um, not just the About Time Project, which you will find in our in our uh, About Time YouTube channel. Um, I think Paulus ended up putting some links to some of the talks you've done in our podcast in our in our chat oh awesome thank you so that's great so people will be able to find that plus um we can find you on old skepticality episodes and your website data skeptic the podcast that you can listen to um there's a lot of people here who are absolutely into this um number stuff and they were talking about theorems and stuff like that and oh, I look forward to scrolling back then. They're and having it. And Deborah says there are dots. two people in here that have October 28th. Is that right? Who are those two people? Deborah, do we know? October 28th birthdays? Uh, let's see if she says really quick. Well, anyway, thank you so much, Kyle. Thank you so much for My sharing. pleasure. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And your disco um, background is great, too. I, I love that. I look forward to that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. He'll be around a little bit, so you'll be able to... Um, talk to Kyle if you really want to. And um, again, um, 
friend him or whatever, and you guys can have uh, math data related conversations uh, for for hours if you want. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whether you want it or not. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna do one thing I really. Have to tell him about the nine of spades. Oh yeah. Well, he'll have to. Okay. I want to do. Um, we're gonna move to mono really quick, but before. Oh, Brian. And can, can we thank Kyle publicly, by the way, for every time we give a GSO editor's number, you know, page views? It's all it's all because of Kyle. Yeah, kind of. 